So I, I do bless your name, Father. I do also thank you for another opportunity to to learn together in the scriptures or in your word this morning. I do ask that every heart involved or truly involved would be blessed by the <coughs> wisdom and the truth spoken <coughs> or shared. Lord, I do ask that your your spirit would move and lead, Lord, in both what is shared and also in how it is received and processed, Lord, and applied in each heart and mind. I do thank you for, Lord, the, the many wonderful things, Lord, that you have revealed in the scripture of Revelation, Father. Lord, I do ask, Lord, that the, the truth that has been revealed in it would be pursued by um, each one of us, Lord, to, to receive a greater understanding of Lord, what you seek to uh, share through it. <clears throat> I do thank you for the, for the, the truth of Lord, finding that same that rhythm or cadence that is Lord, revealed in uh, the song of the Lamb. Lord, of those that you have called out as a, of, as a people. Lord, what a, a wonderful truth this is. Lord, as is it, is it, it is expressed Lord, in the scriptures. Lord, I do pray that it would be expounded upon, Lord, and made real even in our own lives. Lord, as we seek to, Lord, not engage in these things simply as words <coughs> or on paper, Lord, but as something that is true and active and real in this time. I do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, as we <clears throat> move along in this writing, um, at, at least call to mind uh, the some of the progressive nature of what's being unveiled by Jesus to, to John, who wrote this uh, this uh, prophetic writing in that <clears throat> early on we were really making observation of not only the things that John was seeing initially when he was taken into the heavenly realm and Christ came to him <clears throat> in a very different way. He was seeing uh, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, um, in a way that I would suppose even in a form, spiritually, uh, that he had not seen uh, while Jesus was walking on the earth, even after his resurrection. But then Jesus begins to show John um, certain things in the realm of the Spirit related to God's work in man, in the soul of man, <clears throat> in the makeup of man. And how he has designed or ordained a way in which man's life is ultimately to be overtaken by the, the life of God. And the soul of man subdued by the reign of Christ. So something that is progressive is, or we could also say that is continuing to expand as we go through the writing, is how this same coming and judgment is met out not only in the inner man but also outside the man <clears throat> and ultimately to the whole world and then to those governing systems that are not just of this world of this realm in the earth but also in the heavenly realms and that's where we've been for the last several chapters really since around chapter 12 if we as we have seen put out before us a, an illustrative description of two different rules, two different seats of authority, two different reigning authorities, but also, as we continued, those were being portrayed as two very different ways of life, two different cultures, one that produces death, destruction, the other that is and goes unto life life everlasting. And so in this, we saw the, the birthing of the man-child and the persecution of the saints. 
directly coming from uh, or as a result of as well <clears throat> the dragon and his angels losing their seat of authority in the heavenly realms being cast to the earth and then making another attempt yes to establish their rule in the midst of mankind this rule is not only a rule that is on the earth through the governments of men, it will certainly impact and have a direct correlation to those things in many ways. But it also has to do with the mindset or the, the cultural mindset in, within mankind, something that has existed through the generations of man. Through every, it has maintained a grasp on men's uh, outlook in life and perspective in life and goals and pursuits in life <clears throat> throughout the ages and kingdoms of men. And so what we're seeing described here in Revelation is very much a, a culmination or fulfillment, something that we talked about last week was that this is very uh, similar to what is described in Jesus' parable as the day of the harvest. So certain seeds have been sown those plants have grown, many appearing to have certain similarities, but the final product or the fruit will basically uh, reveal the true nature of the plant itself. <clears throat> and the way that that is described in the parable that Jesus had was the weed and the tares. And we are seeing now that parable or the illustration of that parable fruited out in the midst of mankind, not as a fruit that grows on a plant, but a fruit that is produced through a way of life. What is the product of living in this way? Whether that be in an individual life or in as representative of mankind throughout a number of, of epochs or ages or kingdoms. <clears throat> and those correlate to uh, the things that, that were written about in the book of Daniel, both through Nebuchadnezzar's dreams and, and Daniel's as well. Um, in, in, in not only are there correlations to what was seen in those dreams, uh, but also the, the meanings were very similar as well as it relates to the kingdoms of man throughout the ages uh, and the way that they are differentiated in the two writings. So, just as a reminder, <clears throat> in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's dream viewed or the perspective of the kingdoms of man through Nebuchadnezzar's dream was as this beautiful statue made of very uh, made of precious metals, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and there was a very prideful view of what those kingdoms were. And their stature. Now we know that it was in also Nebuchadnezzar's dream that uh, the um, <clears throat> the stone hewn from the mountain was cast at that image, that statue, and crushed it to dust, blown away in the wind. And then that rock itself became a mountain that rose up and covered the face of the earth, became the mountain of mountains. That mountain and other mountains being described in prophetic writings as ruling orders. And we're going to see that uh, touch here as well. Uh, we already have in the previous chapters. We will in the next couple of chapters. But one of the things that was differentiated there, so it, with Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we have the, the beautification, in essence, or you know some attempt to describe the glory of the kingdoms of man. But when Daniel sees his dream, and the interpretations are the same. These are the nations or the kingdoms that are to come. Well, the way the Lord sees it is as a beast, a devouring beast, a destroying beast that comes out of the earth. That's the Lord's view of these things. And that's an important um, observation to make because that same principle of the dichotomy between how man sees certain things and how God sees certain things is going to play a significant role in understanding the imagery that is described in Revelation. 
So directly correlating to Daniel would be uh, what we saw in Revelation 13, um, starting in Revelation 12 and 13, which is the dragon and the beast, the beast coming out of the sea and then the beast coming out of the earth. These are very much representative of the things that Daniel saw looking towards uh, the latter times and the fulfillment of all things. Um, something that we've discussed in, in previous sessions is that we're not necessarily talking about the end of all things. <coughs> Excuse me. But we are talking about the end of a certain way of life. Uh, and which, in essence, is a beginning of a way of life <clears throat> that, all, that God has always desired and hoped for his people. And that was something that he had planned before he ever created. Rich, do you mind making me a glass of water? <clears throat> so we're going to see the same differentiation um, and uh, uh, described. So one of the la in the last session as well, <clears throat> One of the great demarcations was between those who had the name or the mark, that way of life character uh, upon them, and that enabled them to function in a certain way in the world. And then there are those who received a mark on their foreheads, as was said in previous chapters, from the, a, a seal from the Lord, okay, those who were sealed. And set apart by God. So we have these two groups of people that are compared to one another. Ultimately, what is being for, uh, compared is not one number of people to another number of people, but rather one who have come to a place of maturity and fulfillment of God's purposes and ways, which then themselves, just as the, when the wheat bears its fruit, then you can say, okay, this is a kernel of wheat, and you can look at the tear and say, this is a weed, and it's easy to tell because the fruit is here, and this doesn't have it, and that's that, in essence, is a judgment because you're comparing the two, and one has value, and one must be destroyed, okay, and that's the same kind of valuation that is taking place between these two different life types, these two different ways of life. Now, in chapter 17, we're going to see what we've said again and again. We see these, these um, uh, trying to think of how to describe it. We see these scenes play out before us, okay? And then we see a similar scene but expanded further. So now we're going to be in chapter 17 and 18 looking further into what is this beast and who is this prostitute and what is – what is to become of them? And that will be looking into this next few chapters. What we're going to see is, is fairly astonishing, says John. And the, the word astonished uh, or put in a place of wonder and awe is used several times in this chapter, all kind of all in just a few verses. But the surprise or the wonder that is there, I think would come maybe as a surprise to many in, in Christianity as well, because we have separated ourselves from what we, what we deem to be the evil things of the world so much in our minds that we don't imagine that something could be compared to the people of God in a certain way. But it doesn't take a whole lot of scriptural research to see <clears throat> how harsh God himself has been in his description of his people when they live in rebellion to his ways. And uh, <clears throat> that, that, is, that is shown from very on, early on in scripture. Um, especially after the formulation uh, of the nation of Israel. So let's begin to look at chapter 17 and read through it. We are going to see this, this certain description um, of the woman, this prostitute, the harlot, and the beast that she sits on um, at some point <coughs> uh, in, in after the first few verses here, we're going to make a comparison uh, between, and that's why I want to, to offer this bit of an introduction as well, because there's ultimately going to be a comparison here between the true church and the false church. Um, uh, again, we may have Considered the harlot to be 
<clears throat> you know, the pagans of the world, those who reject God and those who turn their backs on God and uh, despise him. And what we're going to see is that it is actually those who imagine themselves to be something for God and represent God, but have mixed their way of life uh, in what the scriptures calls adultery and idolatry and fornication with in an impure way with the nations and especially with the other cultures of the earth. And that is to the Lord an abomination because it takes away the sanctity and the purity of the way of life that belongs to his people and is given to his people as a gift, as, as a grace from heaven to his people. And the Lord hates that. The Lord hates it. Chapter 17 begins, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. The picture here is very similar to the picture that is given by the Lord about Israel in Hosea. Maybe we can turn briefly there and read some of Hosea so that we can see or hear uh, some of the comparative language <clears throat> that God uses, not about the people of the world, but about his own people. Chapter 4 in Hosea, this, there are remnants of this all throughout this writing of, uh, uh, of Hosea, but we're going to just read uh, a section of chapter 4 so that we can hear some of the, the, the similar similarities uh, in description. Chapter 4, 1 in Hosea. <clears throat> Hear the words of the Lord, you Israelites. So who's he speaking to? He's speaking to Israel. Because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. What land? The promised land of God. The land that God promised he would lead his people into. Now that promise came, was given with conditions, which was, if you follow my ways. If you learn of me and follow my ways. If you are committed to me. So when we think of prostitute and adultery and harlotry, what we're going to see it compared to is commitment, marriage, wife, husband. What's the difference? Covenant and the breaking of the covenant. How to, and so in, with that in mind, listen to how the Lord describes this in Hosea. The Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no faithfulness, no commitment to the covenant. No love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. Acknowledgement of God is not a recognition that there is a God somewhere out there who did something. Acknowledgement of God is a full recognition and reverence to his ways, to know him. Not to know about him or know of him, to know him. But he says there is no acknowledgement. There is no fear and reverence for God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery. They break all bounds, all the lines, all the, the, the bindings of the covenant are broken. And what? Bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land mourns and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea are dying. But let no man bring a charge. Let no man accuse another. For you, for your people are like those who bring charges against a priest. You stumble day and night and the prophets stumble with you. So I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. So he continues to basically say, I'm going to punish you for your waywardness. And 
ultimately he let's move uh down to verse 10 now continuing with the the curse that the lord is speaking out they will eat but not have enough they will engage in prostitution but not increase so they will not bear good fruit because they have deserted the lord and to give themselves to prostitution to old wine and new which take away the understanding of my people they consult a wooden idol and are answered by a stick of wood a spirit of prostitution leads them away, and they are unfaithful to their God. Anyway, so he describes Israel directly as a prostitute. Now let's go back to Revelation 17. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Now waters here are representative of the many Nations, tribes, and tongues of the world. With her, with this prostitute, the kings of the earth committed adultery. Now let's think. Who are the kings of the, the earth? They are those who sit in places of authority. So if we can, and we should, see that there is a comparison here where the prostitute is representative of the waywardness of God's people. They're their lack of faithfulness to the covenant of God and specifically their idea that they need to have relations with those who have power and authority, the kings of the earth. That is the adultery, the prostitution that is acted out here. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. So, what benefit and what blessing the people have had. It's very difficult, actually, for, for, for me to even say the people of God because this is such an abominable thing. And I don't want to point it out to, you know, one group of, of those who call themselves Christians, believers or otherwise. This is more of a mindset, okay? Okay. I'll try and illustrate it a little bit with some of Israel's history. Israel was called out of Egypt. Yet, in the days of, their, of Israel's kingdoms and her kings, she continually went or thought to call back on the strength of Egypt for help rather than to cry out to God or to trust in God. That was very displeasing to the Lord. And so there is something that has been in the mind of man that continually thinks in a certain way. In fact, when Israel first asked for a king uh, from the prophet Samuel, and Samuel took an offense to that as the one who was appointed by God in their midst, and the Lord said, Samuel, don't be offended. They're, they're, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And what did Israel say? They said, we want to be like all the other nations. That is the great harlotry of God's people throughout the ages is that they look at the world around them and they say, well, we want some of that. We want to be like that. We want to have some of those things. Now, it's a mixture because they have not always said we want all of those things. They just said, well, we want what we want. And so they have gone to the kings of the earth, those ruling authorities or we don't have to think of the ruling authority only as a governmental seat in a nation or a town or anything else. We can look at it as those things that are perceived by someone else to have benefit for their own way of life. So if God pre presents a certain way of life and says, this is pure and undefiled, go and live in this way. And then... Those who they those same people look at the other people of the world and they say, but they have those things and we would like them too. And as much as the Lord tried to say those produce bad fruit. The people of God throughout the ages have consistently said, yeah, but we kind of want that anyway. Again, this is the great fornication that has taken place. Now, there have actually been. 
agreements made between groups of so-called Christians, God's people, and rulers of the world. One, one example of that would have been back in the days of the early church, after the, the, the great persecution of the church had begun, and there were some Roman emperors who did some terrible things in the persecution of those who followed Christ. Ultimately, Constantine came to rule. Constantine himself was not a believer, but he did know that if he had the Christians on his side, that he would be able to do a lot in the rule. Why? Because the Christians were united together. And so he offered them, basically, we could, we could, we could narrow this down in our description to the agreement between a man and a prostitute who is willing to sell herself for another man's desires for money. Because what Constantine did is come to the leaders of the church, those who he could find, and say, if you will support me to be emperor, then I will end persecution. I will stop your suffering, the edict of toleration. I will allow you to help me rule. Well, that sounded good. And I will give you wealth, buildings, stuff. And that seemed good to certain people at that time. But it was a, a, a great adultery to put such trust in man and in the systems of man. And from that point on, we can clearly see, I've read many historical books about the infiltration of the Greco-Roman culture into Christianity from that time on. And it still has lasting effects unto this day. So let's think of this as, and use it as a, a context for the description of this prostitute and the beast that she rides on. Verse 3. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert, a wilderness. And there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. This is the same beast that was described as coming out of the sea in chapter 13. It was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls, she held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. And this title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Prostitutes, and of the Abominations of the Earth. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Now, before we move on in this chapter, I want to make a quick comparison that we'll probably come back to uh, in another session when, once we get to chapter 21. So here we have described this prostitute, which if it in, is indeed equated to or can be compared to the false church, the false bride, the one who does not stay true to the covenant of marriage. The marriage is a covenant. It's a relationship between man and woman. That's which God said that he has with his people. So let's compare this picture that we just saw illustrated of the false church, the false bride, with the true bride. And we're going to see some very clear similarities in the description. So if you kind of Keep one finger in one place and another in another. Turn over to chapter 21 and verse 9. And before we read verse 9, let's look back at uh, verse 1 of 17, which says, One of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and said to me, Let me show you the punishment of the great prostitute. Now verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Bride speaks of covenant relationship. Wife speaks of covenant relationship. This is the bride of the lamb, she who has made covenant with him. And he carried me away in the spirit 
So let's look back at verse uh, 3 and 17. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit. In verse 3 and 17, it says, into a wilderness. But here in verse 10 of chapter 21, he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high, and showed me. Now he said he's going to show him what? The bride, the wife of the lamb. But what does he see? Or and what does he see? The holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, not riding on a beast with blasphemous names on it. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal, and had a great high wall with 12 gates, with 12 angels at the gates. And rather than having blasphemous names written on it, on the gates were written the names of the tribes of Israel. Now, interestingly, we saw in the previous chapters describing the 144,000, what those tribes are representative of being the fullness or the full representation of God's people, his family. So clearly there's a comparison that's going on. We're continuing throughout these chapters a comparison between one group of people and another group of people. What I want us to see is that is going to be judged here, first described and then judged in chapter 18, is going to be the way of life that is produced from this people. The way of life that is described here by the prostitute is a a mixture and a combining of one way of life with another, one uh, culture way of life with another, and that is with Babylon, which ultimately was, in world history even, the cultural center of the world, and that was what is definitely representative of here during, when, or excuse me, when John was writing this. So let's move back over to Revelation 17. So we, in verse 3 again, we see that there is a woman on a scarlet or a red beast. So just for a moment, and it is covered with blasphemous names. Let's consider this beast out of the sea in a different light. It is the same beast that has seven heads and ten horns. Our focus in this study is not at all uh, to try to equate those seven heads or ten horns to certain governments throughout history or point them to specific individuals or seasons, nothing like that. What we want to see is a, a more uh, fundamental understanding of what this beast is. We know that it is connected to the kingdoms of the world historically and even up into this day. The beast is red. Red in the scriptures in this sense is very much compared to the nation of Edom, which came from Esau. Now, I think when we say Esau, we think of Jacob, and we think Jacob and Esau, and then we probably very quickly think and remember that God said that he has loved Jacob and hated Esau, and then the question that we ask is why? Well, Edom, or Edom being founded by Esau, and Esau, we can take a look at his life and see that he was one who, in essence, he, he paid no reverence to in, and gave no honor to his inheritance or the ways of God passed on to him. And this is something that he basically despised his own birthright given to him. He, he then went on to mix his own family with the families that the Lord had said not to marry. So he went and he married Canaanite, a Canaanite woman, uh, a Hittite woman, and also an Ishmaelite woman uh, to where his mother said, basically, I don't want to live anymore. <laughs> and so, and there is a correlation here to the actions and the, the lack of uh, respect and reverence and honor uh, that is given in describing this, this beast as a scarlet beast covered with blasphemous names. Blasphemous really meaning uh, blasphemy is kind of a funny word, but really it means to be irreverent, to show no honor. 
or reverence. Uh, and it also means to slander, okay? And that's the primary meaning is, is to slander, to think falsely of. Um, I don't know how to describe that. You know, there, there are ways that um, you can put someone in a very negative light through a slanderous statement. And a slanderous statement doesn't necessarily have to be something that seems so directly derogatory, okay? It, it, it's, it's in essence like putting God in a – describing God and the way that he handles or deals with you in such a way in a light that makes it seem like God himself is the one who's got a problem or that he did something wrong. When in reality, the Lord stands in all truth and righteousness, faithfulness, justness, mercy, and love. And to present him in any other light is to slander him. So then, of course, we have in verse 4, described this woman dressed in purple, scarlet, sitting with glittering gold and precious stones and pearls. She held in her hand a cup filled with the abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. What is this filth? What is filling this uh, this cup? Every impure way and expression of God's life. It is the product of adultery, a mixture, a going outside the covenant. So when God's people have gone and intermingled themselves with the world and what the world values and what the world promotes, and the way that the world thinks and plans. It is an abomination to God. It is a breaking of the covenant. I think that's why in verse 6, John says he was astonished at what he saw. Because Who has ever seen the mixture of God's people put in such a raunchy, terrible description as a prostitute drinking blood? But here it is. This is a mystery, it says, written on her forehead. Babylon the Great. The mystery, the the word mystery makes us think, okay, what's the mystery? Who is this prostitute? the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth, of all impure things. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Well, who was it that even called for the crucifixion of the Messiah? Even Pontius Pilate said, I would have my hands Be clean of the blood of this man. I don't see anything wrong with him. Well, what did the priests, the religious religious leaders say in response? Let his blood be on our hands. Whenever the prophets came and spoke to the people of God about the prophets that God had sent them in advance, what did they say? The blood of the prophets is on your heads. You killed them all. Who killed them all? The surrounding nations? The Philistines? The Hittites? No. They were killed by the hands of their own people who would not receive them. The woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. I think that's in part why John is so astonished in a realization who she really is. And the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I'll explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction. No, we're not going to focus on that and trying to figure out when those things have happened or will happen. (laughs) Not in this study. What I want us to see is the identity and the fruit of this prostitute 
this as a way of life. And that's going to be further described as the judgment is, is described in chapter 18. The habitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, so those who have received the mark of the beast, will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was and now is not, and yet will come. So looking back at verse 6, where it says, He saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. This false way or idea or imagination of God's purpose, which has produced this adulterous lifestyle, has caused them to shed the blood of the saints, the prophets, Jesus, those who bore the testimony of Jesus, his way of life, the way of life that he came to represent, the kingdom. This was somewhat described in 16.5 and, and looking forward to their punishment, okay, when the, when the third angel poured out his bowl. And then it says in verse 5 of 16, you are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the holy one, because you have so judged, for they have shed the blood of your saints and your prophets, and you gave them blood to drink as they deserved. Okay? Now here we see this prostitute described as that they who is now shown to be drunk on the blood of the saints. Verse 8 says, Two, that those who have the mark of the beast will be astonished or in wonder at the return of the beast. All right. Let's continue. This calls for a mind with wisdom. Verse 9. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is. The other has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast, who once was and now is not, is an eighth king who belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. So, again, rather than trying to figure out these kings and their times of existence on the earth and as governmental rules, let's not do that. Let's see again that we are seeing a description between two or between the seats of authority, the governance of man, not just through physical government, but also through to influence the hearts, the way of thinking, the way of living in man. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. That's what was described before in chapter 14 as the beast coming out of the earth who gives power and authority to the beast that came out of the sea. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. This is the same if we remember in Daniel 7, oh, I turn right to it, where he says, all of these beasts came out of the sea, that's chapter 7, and then it says in verse 9, as I looked, thrones were set in place, and the ancient of days took his seat. Okay? It says, and the court was seated, and the books were opened. So the seats of authority were made, and then ultimately he says, he judged in favor of the saints of the Most High. Here he says, because he is the Lord of lords, the Lamb will overcome. He is the Lord of lords, King of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Those are the saints, just as described in Daniel as well. So we see what is described in here in, in verses 9 through 13, the various seats of authority that are being uh, laid out and described here. Verse 15. Then the angel said to me, the waters you saw, and I already mentioned this earlier, where the, where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. 
That's a very interesting statement because part of the judgment that is coming against the prostitute is coming from those who she committed adultery with. So she is, will be rejected by God because of her adultery and then rejected by man because of her undesirable impurity. Not because they are pure, <laughs> but because that is very much the natural response of an adulterous relationship. The beast and the ten horns will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God, God, has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. What is the word of God being fulfilled there? The punishment for breaking the covenant. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth, Babylon. Now that is representative of a culture. A way of life in a way of life that has had an influence an impact over every nation tribe and tongue now moving into chapter 18 we see the great crashing or fall of Babylon of a wrong culture and its fruits its product its ways will come to a violent end. Why? Because everything will be revealed in the harvest. And all that is unfruitful or of bad fruit will be cast away. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority. And the earth was illuminated by his splendor. And with a mighty voice, he shouted, now, this is a, a really wonderful thing, this in moving into chapter 19, which we may just read through with very few comments, and then we will pick up uh, in our next section, probably halfway through 19. Because this is the great, not only battle cry, but cry of victory for God's people to see this culture of death finally meet its demise because it has come to its place of fullness and will be judged by God. This is what the angel cries out. Fallen. Fallen is Babylon the Great. What has been put up throughout the ages as the great noble wisdom and ways of man. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people. Separate yourself from this way of life, from this mixture so that you will not share in her sins, in the product of her culture, and the judgment that comes as a result. Come out of her, my people. Realize what she is. Be astonished. And get out. So that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as queen. I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her, death mourning and famine she will be consumed by fire for mighty is the lord god who judges her when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning they will weep and mourn over her why because this 
is not representative of, of, of a culture in, in the narrow sense of that definition, but an entire way of life, including economic structure and governing rules. It will all be exposed for what it really is. Not a pretty thing. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O oh great city, O oh Babylon, city of power, that city which has had such a great influence over the peoples of the earth. In one hour your doom has come, so the way of life is about to change forever. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, brines, iron, and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and bodies and souls of men. How are these ruling orders described by God? Or how does he see them? As devouring, destroying beasts. He doesn't see something beautiful. What we consider today as a quote-unquote cultural heritage, something to be admired and remembered and adorned, maybe even replicated, renewed. He says no. That has consumed everything in the earth, including the lives of men. Verse 14. They will say, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. What you hoped to produce will not be produced. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment, and they will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe, O great city! Dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls, the exact description of the prostitute we just saw. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. An appointed time, one hour. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. They will stand far off astonished, aghast, in wonder at what they are seeing happen, at this exposure. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? Remember, this city is not the description here of a city is not speaking of a particular locale on the earth, but rather an entire system of function, a way of life, economic and otherwise. They will throw dust on their heads and cry out with weeping and mourning, Woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. But now, when we begin this Different perspective. Verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heavens. Rejoice, saints and prophets and apostles. God has judged her for the way she treated you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeters will never be heard in you. No workman or of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. You will not be able to produce fruit. You will have a covenant with no one. Your merchants were the world's great men. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found, at her destruction, in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints. And of all 
who have been killed on the earth. Of all who have been killed on the earth. Truly the product of this culture is death. And it is all being exposed. Now Revelation 19. After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. How has she done that? She has corrupted the earth by and through that mixture, that adultery with another culture or way of life that is impure and unclean. And now he will avenge on her the blood of his servants. Again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Now we see a similar picture that we saw in chapter 4. The 24 elders, and what, when did we first see this imagery? When the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God? When everything was put in the proper order. Under the reign of Christ, the Lamb, and the Lion of Judah. And it talks specifically about that seat of authority. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen, Hallelujah, in agreement. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you servants, you who fear him, both small and great. And then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of washing waters and loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. How? As King of kings, Lord of lords, and the high heavens, the most high God. Verse 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. So where are we back again? We are bringing glory and honor where the covenant has been respected and honored. The covenant. The bride for the wedding of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. How has she done this? Through the purity of her way of life. She has made herself ready. So see, we have this great comparison. One that is being judged, one that is being glorified. Fine linen, bright and clean was given for her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts or fruits or products of, way, of their way of life, of the saints. Then the angel said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At, his feet, at this I fell to his feet to worship him, but he said, do not do it. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Jesus testified to a particular way of life. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It is what God has been speaking through his prophets from the ages, through the ages, pointing to this way of life and to the judgment against what opposes it, <laughs> another way of life, another culture. That's as far as we will go today. We can see the great dichotomy between that God is, is and has drawn this sharp, straight line to cause a difference, for, for a difference to be seen. Comparing one fruit with another, just as we described in our last session. At the fullness of times, the time of the harvest, when all is gathered in, there will be a comparison made. Those fruits will be set on the scales of God's justice and righteousness. 
and only that which was planted by God and has borne the good fruit of the way of his life will tip the scale to his joy and also to the judgment and the destruction of everything that has come against it. Now, for us, let us be all the more encouraged, full of desire to pursue and to produce and to establish and to walk in the way of life that God has given us. It is a glorious thing, and it has a glorious end. That end being the production of a fruit that lasts and that is acceptable to God. That's our destiny and our inheritance. And let us honor God in it. Amen. We'll continue further next time.